And this is just the contents from the book itself. And there's a, as you can see, it's quite a, a complicated list there. Um, very um, extensive, covers a lot of ground from the foundation of those elder gods uh, right up to um, the actual sagas and the stories and the Eddas that describe a lot to do with Odin and um, all the folk tales around that era that were developed. Um, it covers the um, different cultures, the different geographies, the different artifacts that have been found. It, it covers their belief systems. Um, it goes into the cultural um, aspects of magic that were believed, um, the practices. It covers the horsemen of the steppes, various little figures, the giants. There's so much there. Um, in fact, there is so much that it would be impossible for me to create a talk um, and generate any information really because this book is so dense and so big and there's just so much information that what I have had to do today uh, for you is just literally take a snippet out of this entire book and focus just on um, some of the artifacts um, so that I can discuss those and so that you can get an idea of the theme of the book because to try and cover it I'd literally be just spitting out odd bullet point words, which you can get anybody anywhere, because there's just so much to cover. So do forgive me. Um, so first of all, um, please allow me to thank Watkins for inviting me here today and for Anathema for producing and supporting my work um, in the marvelous, fantastic artistic vision and style, um, which the books are beautiful in themselves without the information, they're just a wonder. So. Um, I hope everyone appreciates their hard work there. So without further ado, this, this third book then, it digs deep into the culture um, and the geography, not just of Scandinavia, but of the centuries and the shift in socio-religious and political um, climates that surround the people that um, developed the concepts that ultimately led to Odin. But looking backwards from our point of view today, how can we look at the past and try to determine and filter out what is true and what is fiction? And that's, that's the problem uh, any person undertaking any research is faced with. It really is very, very difficult because over time, myth gets blurred into history and becomes history itself. And that's how things evolve. Um, so one day something may be myth, but the next day it may be history. The next day it may be true, and the next day after that it may be false because different beliefs will have replaced it, and it will then recede into the land of legend. Um, so during the course of my research, I discovered so many anomalies um, in the presentation of beliefs from those periods, um, because what we believe today is not what they believed thousand years ago or 1500 years ago. And that's what I was determined to get to the bottom of, what they believed as best we can looking backwards, which is almost impossible. So removing or trying to remove some of those glosses is what I'm trying to present today. Um, because what I want to present is the way that our ancestors would have seen these um, magical, aspects of the other because everything for them was involved in the other world they enmeshed their entire life into that web um, there was no separation and no distinction so it was important to them that their ancestors were perceived to live amongst them beside them and everything that they did they revered honored them and spoke to them chastised them if things didn't go correctly so it, it's their world and their stories that I wish to get to the bottom of and sadly, the um, literary record doesn't really even begin to explain their narratives. Um, so we have to allow the artifacts to speak for them. And that's, that's really basically where I'm going with this. So the first slide here, these are some of the iconic uh, figures that you can see that have been associated with Odin over time. We've got Hermes and Mercury. We've even got the Khan Abbas giant in, in the UK, this huge giant figure, this Herculean image, which I believe is more akin to Thor, but that's a different story. 
And along the bottom here of the slide, you can see typical images from the last century that we associate with Odin as the wanderer, um, as the horseman in the wild hunt, and as this almost Christ-like divine God. Um, very Jupiterian, very Romanesque. Um, that's, that's how he is um, being perceived. So in my search for Odin in myth and material culture, um, obviously I have discovered him through all of his personas as God, King, Shaman, Poet, Thief and Warrior. And my first two books, I explored all the myths and legends about who he is. In this book, I try to discover what he is and where he is from, his origins and how he developed. And to do that, I've looked through myth and legend, runic inscriptions and the artifacts themselves. So from the cults of the mothers to the cults of the fathers, I've left nothing unturned. I've literally researched so very much. Um, and in the book, I cover everything, all of these, all of these cults. And I cover the use of entheogens from peoples in the ancient worlds to ritual libations, um, the rituals surrounding the customs of, of beer drinking and beer making, um, spellcraft, use of amulets, the deposition of people and objects in peat bogs, uh, war booty and how that they were deposited in bogs, temples, hoffs, burial customs, sacrifice, weaponry. Um, and I strive through all of these um, to discover and unearth the truth. Um, because today we're so reliant upon the visual image, upon what we see presented to us. Um, and everything is condensed down into a soundbite or a clickbait, such that we expect a narrative now to, to be represented by a single image. And it can do if the narrative is perceived correctly. So, although Odin is undoubtedly the subject of all these books, um, much of this particular volume is focused on the culture and beliefs of the people that um, evolved him. And their early gods um, were such that they eventually became ascribed to this figure, this composite figure that I believe developed as Odin. So where does it begin? Well, I think it lives in the Pontic um, Caspian area of the steppe, um, millennia before even recorded history began. Um, and the dispersion and diaspora of various peoples and the migrations and wanderings of many people um, interconnecting and weaving their own beliefs and stories together. And that's, that is what I find most fascinating, that yes, many peoples can have a deity assigned to the wind or the rain or the storm, but each one will be represented through a cultural lens that makes them very different and very pertinent to that people alone. Yet, they still managed to blend and absorb tenets of those from other peoples that they thought would be um, serviceable to them, of use to them, um, so that each deity developed over time to be different from even the way the deities were presented in their own cultures. And it's this constant movement, this constant flux and changes that have made it difficult to pin down with any certainty any particular belief surrounding them. Um, so let's look at some of these artifacts. Okay, so as we can see here, we've got two rows on, and they've come from different places across the world. They've come from as far away as the steppe regions, Staraya Logoga in Russia and Skane in Sweden. Um, <clears throat> the Aparparus cult complexes of Eurasia. And we've got Saxony, Gotland in Sweden. We've even got Norfolk in the UK and Fingalsham down in Kent. So there's many different regions and many of these faces you can begin to see if you study them are very, very similar. And they have very similar styles and features, even though hundreds of years sometimes separate some of these images because there is a reason for that that I will come to. <clears throat> so these features dominated the first millennium 
of our era. Um, and this, amongst these, we've got Roman brooches, silver coins. Um, many of these belong to the Roman military and were dispersed amongst the peoples that um, worked with them um, as, as mercenaries in their armies. Um, now, of course, many of them, uh, many of the artifacts that we have are merely just heads, like, like this one in the middle, the, the one that's from Norfolk. Uh, it's just a head with, with horned terminates that have got bird points on the end that we believe are raptoral birds and bearded face, fairly typical of many of the faces that we see. Um, and all of these have been universally identified as Odin. And I believe none of these are Odin. Um, so this is, this is the controversy um, because many um, so-called experts have identified all of these as being Anglo-Saxon or Norse, and they're not, they're actually not. So where do we go from there? Um, there was um, so much long distance trading between Northern Germania and the Roman Empire, which is why most of this stuff got circulated around originally, and then later through the trading networks that were set up by the Romans. Um, so the thing is, the, the Germanic peoples, after um, the collapse of Rome and the Germanic states received their independence, as it were, they were so impressed um, with the glory and might of Rome and the way that it was structured, its infrastructure and its trading networks and abilities and its social political orders, that it seeked to mimic them. So many of the artifacts that they created themselves uh, were mimicking the, the Roman style of that glorious grandeur and empirical might. This is what they were trying to recreate for themselves. Um, and of course, ultimately, Odin developed out of those um, socio-political and religious ideals, that hotbed, that melting pot of, of concepts um, he ultimately came out of, but that was quite a bit later. At that time, there was just so much turmoil and opportunity and um, abilities for people to develop their own um, systems that it allowed individual scope, even, even within set belief systems. And it's that, those niches that allowed little things to, to develop that have been overlooked that I wish to point out in the book and do, do so in great detail. Um, so using cognitive archeology span and anthropology and comparative ar archeology span and um, anthropology have been able to relate these to other artifacts from these regions so that I can make a fair assessment of where they belong. Okay, so next slide. Now, this is, this is a very good example, this particular um, bracteate. Now, bracteates are thin um, metal discs that were worn as um, amulets. They were worn as medallions. They were often the gift of um, the empire um, for their prestigious awards. They were often made out of gold. Um, Later, hundreds of years later, they were used temporarily as currency, but mostly they were stored as treasure. Now, the imagery on these is often described as almost invariably with Odin or Woden. Now, I do not think, again, that they are um, because there are different cultural ideas prevalent in these imageries. Now, we've got there. Um, and the larger image, we've got someone with flowing hair sat on horseback. So immediately, because it's a person on a horseback, people say, oh, get, there you are. There's Odin on, on Sleipnir. Um, well, we'll soon find out that's not so. Um, there's a gold bracteate there that's very, very prominent. And some of these, as you can see, have got runes on them. They're quite beautiful. Um, they're incredibly detailed and embossed. Um, but 200 years before these were being made by the Germanic peoples and the Swedish peoples in Gotland particularly, um, the Romans were producing these with the heads of their emperors and 
great leaders they, that they wish to commemorate. And these styles were initially, they were, they were mimicking the, those Roman styles of head, but they were later deciding to um, make them a bit more Germanic. So the hairstyles were different, but they're still shown with the great tiaras to show their status, the high status, because after all, these objects do represent high status in, in society. <clears throat> now, some of these imageries are also very similar to the, to the warrior images that we find at Sutton Hoo. Um, because many of these ideas are influenced by not just Roman, but by Byzantine um, designs. So that came from outside the Roman Empire because the, the trade networks were so vast that the influences were, were from so many different regions. Um, and there was a, a massive gift exchange network between chieftains. Um, so everything was about um, reciprocity and respect between warriors and warrior cultures. Um, so I believe this distribution actually represents prestige rather than cult at this time of, of era. So after all of these were Germanized and um, made relevant to, to those people, they were then kept as then hoarded as treasure. And they, they formed great treasure troves um, <clears throat> and were later given as heirlooms and artifacts. And these were buried, uh, found buried in, in Swedish graves, and um, which is, what has caused a lot of the confusion. How did they get there and why? So the Germanic kings here, we've got the horses, um, or what we're told, we're told they're horses, but they're not. Okay. So many of these images were also shared by the um, Slavic peoples. Um, they also acknowledged horse, horses, um, they were tremendous horsemen. And in particular, from those regions, we've got the Batavians. And the Batavians were um, assigned to the Romans. Um, they were very, very um, closely aligned to the Roman system of living and adopted a lot of um, Roman styles. And the, the Batavian royal family <clears throat> actually eventually claimed um, direct ancestorship and lineage from the Roman gods. Um, they were so closely aligned to the Roman way of living, they'd adopted it completely. And this Romanization of many of the Slavic and Eastern European um, and East German gods um, made it even more difficult for a separation and an identification that we can actually say is, is positive. And again, not mistaken for the medieval um, impression of through the literary edders of it being assigned to Odin. Right, so. I move on to the next slide. Now, this is, this. we can finally begin to actually start to break down some of these images. Now in the top left, we've got one here that again is automatically assigned to Odin. In fact, it's advertised on the internet as being a fire steel um, that depicts Odin with his two ravens. Um, now that they're clearly not ravens, they are horned animals, they're zoomorphic animals, and that figure is highly unlikely to be Odin. Moreover, this Fire steel is made of a copper alloy. A copper alloy is an, a wholly unsuitable material as fire steel. It would it would not function in that way at all. <clears throat> um, and of course, it was made of a copper, copper alloy because after the fall of the Romans, the gold was incredibly scarce, and so the um, everyone else had to get pretty inventive with how to forge any metal artifact. 
Um, and this one was formed um, within, it was found within this great hoard that you can see depicted next to it on the right of a number of, of metal objects and artifacts. And in the center of the bottom, there's some more. And these were actually, many of them are found with holes and loops. They were meant to be worn as amulets. Um, they, they show a great variety of different zoomorphic animals that were um, relevant to those belief systems. Um, spiritual um, creatures um, that they had an affinity with, totemic beasts. All of these things are depicted in these artifacts. Um, and of course, as I say, many of them are just falsely advertised, falsely presented and misunderstood because we automatically, uh, we've been programmed and conditioned to believe that every time we see a male figure with either two beasts with him must be Odin. And it, it's, it's sad because this grossly underestimates um, how many other marvelous beliefs were about at that time that we're, we're overlooking for this one view. And they are incredibly rich and, and no less fascinating. Now, many of these were produced during the Vendel period. Um, the, the age of migrations, which was between the sixth and eighth centuries. Um, and so there was an, off, an awful lot of moving around, a lot of trade, a lot of migration, a lot of um, inter, interspacing with people. So with all this um, interlacing and interspacing of folk, you're getting again um, more um, ideas that are being generated and changed and in flux. And so you've got this constant growth and evolution of ideas, as I mentioned before. Um, now, again, a lot of these images are very similar to the ones that we see at Sutton Hill. So again, we've moved from the Pontic step right over to Sutton Hill with an, an impression and an influence of various ideas that were maintained over several hundred years because it was such a popular and iconic image. Um, especially these zoomorphic style animals. So we have to appreciate that not every bearded figure is Odin and not every animal we see is a raven or even a wolf. There are so many other raptoral birds that were of significance to those peoples, especially to the um, finno ogrian shaman. Um, and this is, this is what is um, I find very fascinating about the Slavic connections and the East Europeans and from the Russian regions um, where the Staraya Ladoga um, finds were found. Um, because the, for the Finno Ugrian shaman, the communication with totemic birds was the principal foundation of their belief system. And the anth anthropomorphic um, birds as well on these pendants. Uh, they believed that they, they communicated with them and they were the creatures that protected them. Now, another Finnic tribe um, called the Mari, they were of Russia, also practiced a, a shamanistic faith that elevated nature as a sacred and extremely powerful um, living entity, an egregore. Um, through which the people were fully enmeshed and intertwined. There, again, there was no separation in that belief system either. Now, these, the people, the Mara people lived along the Volga River and they too um, revered a sky god and a water god and a god of the wind and storm. Um, so again, you can see even as far removed as, uh, from Sweden as possible, they've got the similar sort of deities, similar sort of ideas, but in a very, very shamanistic principle. And they also, the Mari also believed that a great number of demigods uh, walked and lived among them as warriors. Now, again, we must appreciate that all of these are warrior cultures. Now, this is something that I covered in, in Odin, the, the second one, the wolf's head, um, because warrior cultures, this, is, this entire period is all about the um, elevation of the warrior, the duties of a warrior, the privileges of a warrior, the... Um, qualities and virtues of a warrior and, and how they were rewarded. 
um, their faith systems, the cultic systems that built up entirely around being a warrior, <clears throat> was not unique to Scandinavia. It was right across the world at that time. Um, it was just a period that elevated warrior into the div divinized status, which is why we now assume that many of these figures were gods when they were actually deified warriors. In fact, the Maori believed that two warriors were so, um, so potent that they actually created the world. Um, two warrior deities created the world and the universe for them. So we shouldn't automatically assume everything is Viking or from the Viking age um, because the, the scope is so much bigger and so much broader than that. And later, when some of these items, these remarkable artifacts were still in circulation um, in the medieval period, they were used, still being used as amulets because they recognized the power and the significance in the elemental quality of these, these um, small, small things. <clears throat> the next slide, um, this is another treasure hoard um, that, that completely here depicts what I've just mentioned there about the mounted hero and the warrior. This, this is something the warriors were perceived as being the ultimate hero. And everyone aspired, or rather the martially inclined, aspired to be a, her a hero. And we've got two very different um, pieces here from two very different parts of the world. We've got this from the Nitsa, and then we've got this one uh, from Sutton Hill from the Bendel period. Now this one is Persian on the left, and this one is Anglo-Saxon on the right. Um, and you can see they're almost identical, um, except the one on the left is made of silver because the Persians loved silver. Um, and you can see the Scythian influence in this as well with the gold gilding and the, the, the uh, armor that the warrior is here wearing. Now, again, they're both sporting spears. They're both mounted. And this is the literal iconic image of a warrior of this period. We had to be mounted and his spear was this all important weapon. Now, the eyes on the horse to the left are specifically relevant because they, they show the otherworldly quality of the horse, of the beast that he's riding, um, because it's, it's staring, it's wide open, it can see into other worlds. Now, these spears, um, which are the, say, the iconic weapon of all warriors, is something that goes back to the Neolithic period, uh, the, the spear is a significance of great power um, because it's something that you had to forge yourself. Uh, swords were not prominent at this period, not even for um, top warriors, it was the spear. And again, this is why this is later associated with Odin because he was given a spear. Now, there are some mythological people um, and beliefs held by the, the Thracians. Now, the Thracians um, are from a region we know today as Bulgaria, or part of Bulgaria. And the, the ancient Thraki people were um, surrounded on all sides by Scythians in the north, uh, Celtic speaking peoples and Illyrians in the west, and Greeks to the south, and peoples from the Black Sea to the east of them. And their artworks, uh, the Thraki, um, artworks all drew from all of these sources to create this, these wonderful artworks. <clears throat> now, spears, as I say, are a mem uh, an emblem of great prestige. It is a multifunctional tool that um, was used for hunting, fishing, war, and for defense and attack. Now, in this second image, in this Vendel, this Vendel warrior here, there is, um, again, the same warrior, same spear. Now, neither depict Odin, in my opinion. They are merely valorizing the role of the warrior in their societies. Now, the, the, the sixth century scholar Paul Jordanes, who mentions um, how the Swedes favored their mounted cavalrymen there, their horsemen were so important to their belief systems. And 
the horses are something that is in such a, a high status that even the sagas mention them. Um, we've got one particular king called Adils, who is always being described as mounting on a horse, fighting on his horse bike, because um, that signifies his, him being a great warrior, or only the greatest warriors rode horses. <clears throat> um, next slide we've got here um, something else that is from the Scythian region. Um, this is a fantastic iconic beaker. It's forged of silver. And on the left, we've got the Tangvid image stone from Gotland. Um, now, obviously, the beaker, as it says there, is late Bronze Age. So it's some thousands of years older than this other image that's moved on in time, but it's still being recorded. We've still got these fantastic beasts. Now, both of them, as we will immediately see, have each got eight legs. And there's obviously some significance to them having eight legs. Um, but what it does show is that the eight legs that are awarded to Sleipnir are not unique. They're not just something that's ascribed to a, a figure that we think is Odin. It's, um, it has got far greater significance than that, of, than that and it's obviously far older. And the ones on the Gotland stone here, the image stone, are obviously being influenced by these from an earlier period. They've, they've learned of this because some of the earlier stones that are representative of mountain warriors didn't have eight legs, but suddenly they're finding eight legs. So they've, they've discovered something and they, they obviously can relate to the idea that, that it represents. <clears throat> now, um, this Thracian cup here depicts a hunting scene. And often, many of these cups that we found since, um, they're not all reindeer like this one is, or stags. They've got, um, there's goats as well, and birds. So um, the, the beasts of the land are always depicted with eight legs. And the reason they have eight legs is because they, uh, in their society, it was very shamanistic. These are seen as the beasts that carry the shaman into the other world and are his helpers or even foes if sent by an opposing shaman. And of all these um, different religions and peoples that surround the Scandinavian period and era, we've got um, shamanism as the basis of their belief systems. Um, and even um, in Scandinavia, um, Norway particularly, we've got the Sami influence coming in, who are also a very shamanistically based society. Um, and far away in Russia, um, in the Arctic, Siberian, we've got the Tungus shaman. So there is so much coming in and around that's feeding into um, the normal, general, Germanic view of the universe, which in itself was remarkable. But they're getting so much influence that's changing their own perception and molding their perception of how they view the elements and the elemental forces. Um, and of course, in the Thracian religion, at that time, it, it um, is very much centered upon the mystery cult of Orpheus, um, who himself was an ecstatic being of poetry and song and the underworld, the Catonic regions. Um, so again, we can see similarities in characters and beings. Um, and if we found those icons in, in Bulgaria and around the Greek and the Baltics, we wouldn't assume they were Odin. We would know that they were Orpheus and other um, figures of their own mythology. Um, and I think that's important to, to understand the parallels and similarities. Okay, now during the late Bronze Age and the early Iron Age, considerable con cultural contacts transpired between the Pontic shores of Thrace, as I said, in northern Greece and across to Asia Minor that led to significant religious exchanges. Um, and I think that's where they got the notion of an ecstatic cult from, in addition that sat over the influence that they got from the Sami. Um, now, in the next image, we, the Vadstena 
bracteate that I will show you next actually relates back to these beasts. Now, here we have again another mounted rider, very similar to the previous one. Um, and again, this is another one that's been identified. It's got a, a raven, a horse, and a person on it. Except if you look, it isn't a horse. It's got toes. And horses have hooves. So these toes are telling us it's a different beast entirely. Now, it's not an artistic mistake because many of the um, bracteates, the ones we saw earlier, are produced like this, they're designed like this. Some of them do have hooves and are very definitely horses, and some of them are not. Um, moreover, they've, they've got this peculiar little um, thing on its head here that looks like horns. Um, it's made to look like horns, <clears throat> but it's, it looks almost like a metal object that's been put there. It's almost like it's part of the dressage. And in fact, these um, things on the feet are also dressage items. We found them in graves um, and it's been difficult to determine what they could have been used for. But if they're actually put onto a horse, they make it look like something else. They make it look like a different animal entirely. Um, and this is why many of these images are, are dis, um, described as being zoomorphic um, because they present puzzles. Um, you know, are they horses or are they deer or are they something else entirely? But the purpose of, of these is, as, is something that we'll, we'll come to in the next slide, because we can see here, this is Scythian horse armor that's been found in Scythian graves. Now, on the one on the left there, you can see this curious little um, item is in between the ears. It's the same as that one there in the in the Vadstenobrachiate, you can see it um, on its on the top of its head here. Now, again, in this respect, this has been made. The one on the left has been made to look like a zoomorphic animal. The one on the right, the horse, has got antlers, so it's clearly being made to look like a stag. There are also others where they're made to look like reindeer, um, and that I find very fascinating because. There's obviously a reason why horses are being made to look like different animals and why that's obviously been going on for some time because they are, they are being depicted on the earlier bractates hundreds of years before this or 500 years before these were done. So what is actually going on here? Um, there's obviously... more going on than them being um, a prestigious or even decorative or ceremonial notion. There's obviously some deep-seated spiritual and shamanic reason um, why they're wanting to <clears throat> present these as beasts of the other world, as if they're merging um, all the best benefits of those animals together to create a composite that would be um, a fit transport to take someone into the other world to ride through into the other world again this comes back to why we have eight legs because it's the extra legs that allow them to shift between the worlds makes it an otherworldly beast in other words <clears throat> now the scythian and the batavian warriors were especially renowned for their superior horsemanship as explained their entire cultural um, importance was centered on the horse and Scythian horse armor, armor particularly is incredibly elaborate, especially in funeral contexts. They have all these tremendous decorated shapes and the horned crowns and dazzling breastplates on the horses themselves. They didn't just ride into battle with these to create confusing, confusion in their enemies, be dazzled by these incredible zoomorphic beasts. They, they believed they were connecting to the spirits of the other, of the land whites and their ancestors, and they were riding with the dead through um, to literally obliterate their enemies. Um, we've even found um, horse, um, on, not quite saddles, but like saddles, um, a thing that you put over the horse, the dressage, that hung down with extra legs 
so that when these beasts were running, it would look like they had eight legs, like they were from the other world. So they didn't just draw these things or create them in art history. They actually used them um, in battle and in ceremony. So they, they, it was something they took with them in every aspect of their life. Again, as I say, there's no separation in their world between the other and the ordinary. There was no ordinary. Everything was, was infused with spirit and everything was directed towards an engagement with spirit. <clears throat> So um, here we can see, obviously, the importance of, of the warlords and the positions and power that they held and the prestige and how the ordinary people would have looked to them as being almost deified because of the power they commanded in, in all the realms, in all the worlds. Um, and that they would, see, would be seen as these great mediators. So already we can begin to see how the character of Odin was being developed. Um, through all these cultures, how they were merging to create this composite. <clears throat> okay. Now we've got here in the next slide, um, this, this is one of my favorite images. Um, and the artist who's produced these for my book has done the most fantastic um, rendition of this. Um, many of these are, are reproduced in the book. By, by him, and they are just wonderful. Um, but here we can see um, a person, the Nenets uh, and Samoid peoples of Siberia, the Arctic regions, um, on a sled, and he's driving past. Now, this top illustration, this one is a Getty image, and it was, um, it depicts, it's a 17th century traveler to these regions, and this is what he saw. It was record, recorded. He saw all these. Um, strange regions where there are loads of shrines on the hill um, of what he presumed were totemic figures, ancestral figures. They were um, places where people would leave goods and offerings for the dead. And they are depictions of their ancestors. There's male and female there. And they're, they're, they're crude wooden slats that are just pinned into the ground. And He's on his sled and he's going past and he sees this, this sacred ground where all these are. Now, again, um, this depicts how the reindeer are pulling the sled and here's a traveler he's moving through. But it, what, it, what the photograph below is showing is the similarity, this is a modern photograph, of the sled and the reindeer that are used in exactly the same way hundreds of years later. The way that you move and travel um, in these regions doesn't, doesn't change very much, um, especially for nomadic peoples. You know, they rely very much upon their animals. Um, <clears throat> and again, this is just to show how important these images are. And, and the reason for that will become clear in, in the next couple of slides. But um, these are merely to convey to you how important it was that they have these animals, the sleds, and the ancestors, um, all of these things connect to their culture. And this is why these things are depicted in their art. Um, they're reindeer herders, and this is, this is what they do. So we've got these polycephalic hosts of the Nenet people. Um, and the next slide is the reason why I wanted to show you those, those sleds. So if we flip back to that just very quickly, you can see the sled with the slats and how it's constructed. And here, um, now there's a bright T8 here and there are also two pieces of rock art. Now, in all the books that I've seen, these are described as boats, boats on the rock art. Now, again, if you look at those images I've just shown you of the sleds, you can see these are more likely to be sleds than boats. And it's also more in keeping with the culture that they would have sleds rather than boats. Um, now, again, they've got, in, in this bright T8, you've got this very, very strange drawing that nobody's been able to decipher yet. And there are lots of bright T8s like this with, with bizarre and curious imagery and that requires immense study 
And this one is, I believe, showing a person on a sled. Um, also, in just the same way as this, this prehistoric rock art is. Again, these, these things don't change over hundreds of years. Um, and again, there's, there's some twig tangas, um, the, the tree-like twigs beneath him. But his style of dress, if you look at how he's dressed, again, those tight pants and the band around his waist, we see these things um, on so many of these artifacts. They're so similar, this style of dress, right through from Rome. These are, again, items that I mentioned in Wolf's Head in the, in the last book, because it's, it's indicative of the warrior style. They're described as being naked, apart from these belts around their waist, um, where they, they hung weaponry from. And in some cases, they may have been naked, but in other cases, I, I believe they wore tight pants. I think this one might be naked. <laughs> um, but he's got, he's holding weapons. He, whether he's fighting or hunting is just difficult to discern, but he's clearly on a sled, as are these, these figures below him. And again, these, they're reindeer herders. They, this is what they do. Um, so these rock art images um, go past uh, funerary complexes again where they are uh, across the steppes and wasteland. Now it's interesting, um, just, I'd just like to, to explain this. Some of the um, islands um, in these far regions and these frozen sanctuaries, um, the Scandinavian poets sang about them um, and they mentioned the islands of Vea and Euroria, excuse my um, pronunciation, that's probably entirely incorrect. Um, from these Siberian regions, which the Scandinavian people referred to as Jotunheim. So they were well aware of these frozen wastelands. They knew where they were. They knew how these people lived. Um, and of course, these many of these drawings are huge. So they presumed they must have been giants. So here we have the next, next piece of rock art. And uh, the, the one on the left is called the root fragment from Stora Vale in Gotland. And the other two are petroglyphs on, on the bottom right. And the top right above it is just a sketch of the entire drawing. Now, again, this is another one of those anomalies that have been described as a boat, which again, I think is a sled. Um, similarly, in the root frag fragment there on the left, you've got, um, the artist who was using this um, photograph has outlined, over, over outlined the actual indentations um, to what he thinks was the, the image that was beneath it. It's badly scored, so it's very difficult to actually determine. But you can see there's a figure there, very similar to the figure that we've just seen, um, shown almost naked, but this one's wearing one of those terminated horned helmets. Um, and he's also stood over a mountain and it looks like he's pushing, pushing that. Now, again, if you look um, to the image on the right, you can see again, this sled with a figure underneath it, again, in tight hose or naked with his belt around his waist. And he again appears to be lifting it. Now they may be lifting it over glaciers, over small mountains or rocks. And again, it would be um, quite a feat for a, a strong, big warrior to perform. And in the bottom two pictures, you can see the actual photographs of these petroglyphs. So you can, you can see how important um, it is to understand what the pictures actually represent rather than what we are told they represent, because without that understanding, you lose the entirety of the culture, the cultural perspective and the belief system that, that that entails and relates to. So if we can get such a basic thing wrong, then everything we build on top of that um, just, just runs away into nonsense and fiction, complete fiction and fantasy, and we are lost then. Um, and it's very difficult to come back from, from that depth of, of error. But I find these um, sleds quite fascinating. Um, so, so thank you for bearing with me while I describe those. What, what's particularly important is, is their rev reverence for the dead. 
and for the um, ancestors and the ancestral totems and those polycephalic images and wooden totems that they that they bypass. Now again, this is another one um, from the Nenets, Nenets people. And these are often placed on tiny little islands that they have to travel out to. They're islands that are dedicated entirely to the dead. And each one of these lovely little um, images is, is a carved face of an ancestor that represents the ancestors as a, as a total and as individual. Um, they we don't know whether they're for an entire clan or for a tribe or just for one family. Um, there are several of these on these little islands. Um, so over hundreds of years, it could be anything. Um, the people there now tend to have one that they just offer, offer to now. They're often not replaced or, or built on. Um, it's not something they um, create in the same abundance as they did in the past. But um, they are revered still, which is, shows remarkable continuity of cult, which again is very, very important that we don't forget these ancestral traditions. Now, again, what I want to point out here is the faces, because these are the faces that are timeless. They're the same faces that we see over and over again, as we can see in the next slide here. And this Shigia um, ancestral to totem from Russia is immense. It's, it's meters high, five meters high, I think it is. And it's nearly 12,000 years old. It's absolutely fantastic. But again, it's show it's a huge wooden structure as many of these things are, but what it depicts time and time again, all these images is the totemic reverence for our ancestors and how we stylize them in their faces. And again, these are the things that are shown in all the artifacts, all these faces, and some of them are bearded, some of them are not. But unfortunately, or rather tragically, so many of these things are now seen and found and are automatically identified as Odinic. Not this one, because it's too old. But many of the others, people would say, that's Odin, that's Odin. And they're not, they're just ancestors. They're revered ancestors. Well, not just ancestors, they are revered ancestors. Um, and they are remembered in all of these artifacts. And that's the thing, that's what's important. So, <clears throat> again, these faces are seen, um, are very similar to some of those early artifacts we saw in the, in the second slide. <clears throat> Let's see if I can find them for you. If I can go back far enough. Just, oops, there we go. As you can see, some of these faces are very similar, especially the one in the bottom right, the Fingelsham belt buckle, and the one above it. Um, they've got the same sort of faces, and the one on the far left on the Apacra cult complex, and the one below that, and the one next to it, I shall be discussing in a moment. Um, the one in the middle on the top also has similar sort of face, but what, even where they're slightly different or bearded, they're following the same principle. And, and that's what's important. So here we are. So that's the Shigia. Now, again, many of these are, are reproduced across Mongolia and Eurasia. Um, they're, they're called balbals there. And many of these are erected in stone because there are very few trees on the plains. Um, so they've been fashioned out of stone. But again, they follow very, very sim similar lines. Um, they are sometimes bearded, sometimes not. And they've got the long faces and they're all erected in very sacred areas to commemorate the dead, often on mounds, sometimes just outside the mounds um, as guardians of those sacred places of the dead. But basically, um, over millennia, over all of these, you know, geographical regions and time spans, we see the same things occurring to commemorate the dead um, and as icons of the ancestors. Um, and it makes me wonder, 
um, about the ermine saw and the Geismar oak and many other um, of the supposed totems that were at Uppsala. Were they similar to this? Um, I guess we'll never know, but I imagine that they would be. I can't see why they would not. <clears throat> and again, we see this kind of idea condensed down in, in later periods. These are some of the ball balls. Um, these are, um, some of them are about human size and some of them are a little bit taller. And the one on the far right there, he's got a right and a drinking horn. Um, he's a bearded warrior. And the one on the left is definitely a warrior that's commemorated because he has all of his um, weapons with him. And they're carved into the stone itself. <clears throat> now, again, in the um, Anglo-Saxon era, we've got lots of wet stones being um, prominent. And the one at Sutton Hoo on the left was found there, the Sutton Hoo whetstone, um, tremendous symbols of kingship and authority. Um, then on the right, we've got one that was found over in um, Czechoslovakia. Um, and then we've got the one that was found in Novgorod, in the middle of Peruna. And they all, again, we've got these little, these little faces, exactly the same face as carved now. These faces are carved on top and bottom of the Sutton Hill whetstone. They're just on the top of the Wallen uh, whetstone <clears throat> and on the actual figure itself of Peruna that found in Novgorod. Again, they've got these faces um, because these are the totemic um, batons of kingship that they, that they wear and use to represent the authority that rolls on from one to the next. It's cumulative. It's, it's not just, I am now king. I am king in the shadow of all those other kings that went before me. And I rule with their authority and their spirit. So this symbol is, is tremendously important. And this is why we have these faces carved on them to show the, the military elite and the superiority and authority in, in the work that they do. <coughs> Excuse me, <coughs> I'm just getting over that chest there. <coughs> trying to move this on but it won't it seems to have got itself stuck maybe it's warm now <clears throat> this buckle here <clears throat> was <clears throat> excuse me shown on on one of the earlier slides and i think this one is particularly fascinating um let's see if i can find this, this title of it because i think it's really um, important It's from Ellsworth Holdenkamp. Um, and as you can see, this one in particular is often touted as being representative of Odin, specifically this one, um, because it has the eye missing. Now, there's a lot of controversy about this, and a lot of people have written about this and, and tried to express that this was done deliberately, and it may have been. Um, but originally, it is thought from its time period and its use that it was um, a Frankish buckle that depicted the face of Christ. Um, they had long been um, converted to Christianity. Um, and if it was adopted later to represent the outcoming myths of Odin, that's, that's fair and fantastic. But originally it, it was not designed to represent Odin. It had two eyes originally. Um, they were both in the yellow field. Um, it's, it's a little sort of like a solder that's put in. And in many of the photographs of this, I had to really search hard to find this one. But in many of them, the scoring, the heavy scoring that you can see on the front and back there is airbrushed out. Um, so that it just looks smooth. And like the eye was, was never meant to be there. But you can see from this heavy scoring that goes right across the eye and for, on the back of it that it's seen some battle. And 
we all know that many things that have got even slightly raised, um, if you've got wearing jewellery or belt buckles and they've got slight little bits of metal that are raised, how easily those are caught and, and dragged out. And I think that in this one has been, that's what's happened in some conflict or battle or even just general wear rubbing against another item. That eye has been pulled out. But you can certainly see from the heavy scoring, it's, it's had some panel. So it's unsurprising that it would lose an eye. And there are several artifacts that are very similar to this where there is an eye missing. Um, but I think, again, there is good reason why many of these are missing. Not all of them. Some of them will have been definitely fashioned to represent Odin, but not all of them. We, we are far too eager to jump to that conclusion that everything we see um, must conform to the way we now see, see him. Okay. Right, so my conclusion I'm going to summarize today um, is simply um, that amongst the Northern peoples, because I'm going to read from my notes here, there's just a few things I wanted to make sure I don't forget. Among the Northern peoples, the anthropomorphic deities, including Woden and Odin, developed only during the migration age as tutelary patrons obscure spirits rather than gods, as we now perceive them. So absorbing those former elemental virtues, their delineation is not so sharply defined as some might imagine, reflecting instead the modern propensity for compartmentalizing and categorizing the spectrum of non-human virtues of form and force. Our ancestors were oblivious of such distinctions, recognizing the fluidity and ambiguity of such things. From this brief summary, we can deduce a history of belief and cultural practices whose origins in the Eurasian steppe explain the significance and purpose of certain distinct totems, philosophies, tribalisms, honor, hospitality, and such codes that dominated Scandinavian mythology and culture seemingly without precedent. There is a driving imperative to unveil the roots of cumulative belief and its influences that ultimately syncretized in the Viking culture, much of which has been erroneously attributed to an Edenic cultus by the creation of the composite figure we have now come to know as Odin. As early as the sixth century common era, the Eastern Roman historian Procopius refers to a certain South Slavic tribe, noting unwittingly perhaps that the Slavs maintained no pantheon of gods. Now, this is something I'm very, very um, struck by, and it's something that I hold to with God, Scandinavian um, peoples. I also believe they had no pantheon. I think it's a mistake to say and refer to their deities as pantheon. Um, and I, I go into great detail in the book. I've skipped very, very quickly through all of these, but all of these things I've been discussing today are mentioned in greater detail, um, far more explicitly in the book. <clears throat> Instead, rather than a pantheon, they held a singular reverence for the thunder and lightning spirit, seen as the overarching sky father. Now this begins to sound familiar, doesn't it? the Lord of all, to whom they dedicated all animals killed for celebratory feasts that were held in his honour. This divine spirit shares the virtues of all variations and manifestations amongst the Bonts, the Thracians, Phrygians and Indo-Aryans that relate to a supreme divine spirit, particularly the celestial sky. So this figure is the means of wealth and the giver of wealth, suggesting a shared concept with the Germanic Dryton Lord of Providence. And these are, of course, the traits funneled into the construction of Woden and Odin. As Eurasian people leaning into an Iranian perspective, the Slavic world is enriched by elemental spirits of the celestial regions, as represented by their reverence for the bright blue sky and all things that fall from it, as the male generative force in the form of rain, hail, snow, thunder, and lightning. It is therefore regrettable that an overfamiliarity with popular Norse mythic literature from a much later period 
has led to frequent citations of these images in modern works in association with Odin. Yet nothing from the early medieval period supports these claims. We should discern the gulf between what is known and proven and what is surmised and conjectured. The leap to Odin remains unsupported, unsupported sorry, by archeology, span philology, and anthropology. Therefore, in my assessment, all such assumptions are premature. Odin does not appear in written form until the late Viking age, as late as that, it really is quite late. As a previously unknown figure, Odin emerged from the literary sources, distinct from the elder gods that preceded him, yet oddly familiar, bearing the same ancestral warrior traits, so familiar to those peoples. His careful construction and development are entirely dependent upon the artful puns and Kenninger used extensively throughout the later Eddas and works sourced in oral traditions of Viking Age Scandinavia, where myth and history were artfully woven for the edification and entertainment of kings, chieftains and their retinues in their great halls and hofts during the long closeted winters of those harsh climes. And that's where I'll round that up and um, await any questions or interest in that. Thank you for listening. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think they've, they've assigned it to the, the closest thing that they can um, because um, Snorri, of course, made that name so um, prominent. And of course, the myths that followed that then in the 18th century when they were discovered um, made it so prominent. And of course, the, the folklorist traditions then re, you know, exploded this entire myth that they believed preceded them. And of course, it never did. It was never like that. But all the accumulative associations of just, just feedback to an earlier spirited state of of being that they can only identify by this cumulative um, epithet. So he, he's that's that's how he's been produced, and that's how he's become a household name. And it's difficult to now separate that from everything that preceded him in reality. Very true. true. No, I completely agree. Um, that's absolutely correct. Um, however, the, the, what I'm trying to convey in the book here is, by, is providing historical example that in this case, the, the appearance of Odin was so much later than we have presumed. Um, in the case of many other gods, for instance, if we take something like Aphrodite, for instance, um, we know exactly when that form was generated, when she became a shape, when a, because the myths begin to develop and evolve around that. Whereas <clears throat> we are now looking at somebody's stories that were written, who, are, who themselves presumed um, that they were uh, talking about a, a particular god form. Um, so the, the, the chronicles and the history has become confused because they've backwritten it, like so many of the artifacts that we see. Um, so only after a particular period would those artifacts have been genuinely related to the god form Odin as he had become undeveloped. Prior to that, they would have just been ancestral images. And that's, that's what I'm trying to get across, that Odin developed out of an ancestral tradition, like many other gods. He he, but he isn't as old as many of the other gods. He's practically one of the newest gods that we have. Um, and even though many people believe that he's so much older because the myths have been backwritten. Yes, of course. Um, Tia represents um, a particular force of order and justice and completely the opposite of everything that Odin represents. But Odin, over time, usurps the power and prominence that Tyr represents because he represents a period of chaos and um, dissemination and disruption, whereas Tyr was, was of a period when everything wasn't that way. 
Um, and when order and law, especially orlog, um, how things are written and how things should be, and the fact that everything is ordained and written down and almost fated as orlog is, everything is written and believed in that justice form, that you can't change it. Whereas Odin represents the force of chaos that comes along and says, I can change everything. You know, I can turn all that over. I can dispense with order. I can dispense with justice. I have my own justice. And that appeals to the mercenary, the young up and coming wave um, of enthusiasm and vigor. Um, whereas um, Tia represents the old order. So everything is very different. It's from a very different time period. It, there is definitely a distinction in the way that those gods were perceived and the, the spirits and um, egregores that they represent. And I, I also see Tia as something rather more feminine too. It's um, very much matriarchal in, in its um, abilities um, and its virtues. So you, you, can, you can again see this, this, this new masculine entity that's, that's, that's overturning this old, not a matriarchal system, but a, a matriarchal premise that pervades all of the, the way of life. It's very much an understated um, female presence in, in from the heart right through into these, the generations of um, royalty and the way that things are run and operated. You've got this fear of feminine power that Odin usurps and wipes away. Yes, I do. I think Gimbutas was um, has been much, much maligned. And I think her, her views of the old world, um, especially the old Europe, are, are phenomenally on point. Um, I think what happened is in the wave of feminism century, decades ago, much of this was taken up and, and flags were waved about feminine power. And it was much misunderstood. I think the femininity was much more understated and subtle. I think the feminine power was always in the background, but it was very much, um, very much revered. I mean, even Odin, although he's overturning everything, he still has to acknowledge um, the Vola. He still has to go and pay homage. He still has to do what she says in, in, in essence, however much he balks against it, he's still under her power, um, however much he's trying to overthrow that. And I think that, you know, the old Europe, um, even the land is, is feminine, everything is feminine. Um, and it's not a case of females ruled. They didn't need to rule. They didn't have to have that um, autocracy. They, they ruled by default because they had the wisdom. So they were always referred to. And this is something that I go to in the book, um, how the warriors and the kings always retained tremendous female seers because they had to acknowledge and get their wisdom from them, they had to have their foresight, their insight, their knowledge, and because they didn't have it, their skills were very different and um, had to be operated in tandem with theirs. Um, so all the the skill sets, um, the practical skill sets, were were seen as male, but all the cerebral ones were definitely female, um, and that is how their world was. And we may not agree with that today, but that's that's their world and that's the reality. And we can't change that by back writing it. Yes, it is. And this is one of the, the you know, the controversies about Odin and Loki both um, taught, were taught, say, the by um, Frey. And it's, um, it's, a, it's a remarkable thing that they were able to synthesize those two virtues and become the remarkable um, spiritual beast that they were and function in the way that they could. And this is one of the things that the followers of Odin were in some respects um, misunderstood. Um, they, they were different kinds of warriors. And this is again, is something that I begin to mention in Wolf's Head and I go into in greater detail in the book here um, because the, the warriors were not, um, exclusively 
masculine in the way that we perceive them to be today, they had to have those feminine qualities. Um, they had to be able to understand how spirit works. And there had to be different kinds of warriors. They were not all straight up martial warriors. And so there were different kinds of warriors that followed Odin. They were not all battle hungry. Some of them were, were um, great seers themselves. Some of them were able to um, perform great magics and they were the save men. Um, and they were just different warriors. And it's all of them were employed for different purposes and all had tremendous value. It's a very difficult um, thing to try and explain, but um, the way that the, the Scandinavian system sits <clears throat> with us, the Northern tradition, as we like to call it, embodies the ancestral reverence and it embodies the warrior spirit and it embraces the, the female power of Satan. So it incorporates those elements um, into what it believes is traditional craft rather than witchcraft. That is to say, it, it employs um, many skills from the working guilds of past centuries. Um, but witchcraft being one of them, but not exclusively. So that, that's how we incorporate all of those elements together. It's not um, specifically Odinic, but it does recognize the, um, the warrior power and the, the mastery of runes and the mastery of the self. The, the complete and utter um, focus that Odin can give in states of ecstasy um, and being out of the self, the shamanic aspects. So Odin for us represents those shamanic aspects and in his older self, his former self before he became the cumulative Odin, it's the ancestry that goes behind that. And his um, daring, if you like, to, to break the boundaries, to push, to push ever forward, to not be constrained. Exactly, because his, because his great um, motto was in fate and the overcoming of fate. So um, we're not fatalistic in the, in the remotest sense. We believe that however weird is constructed and whatever is there, we can manipulate it to a, to a certain degree. We can put ourselves into that weave and shift and make subtle changes um, so that we can evolve and, and make whatever it is better or improved or change as we need it to be. And those, those, those aspects are very shamanic in themselves. They are, they are based in that shamanic tradition. Um, and of course, you know, Robert Cockham was all about um, changing the self, looking for truth and evolving with Gnosis. And of course, that is what Odin represents. It's grasping Gnosis, always seeking that wisdom. Um, because say the practice is all about how you use the wisdom, but he was all about finding out more. What else can I discover? Where else is it? Where do I go to find it? Um, and so it's not just about repairing and dealing with what you know. It's about finding out what you don't know. Um, so I believe that that is a great Odinic force, really, to push into that realm of unknown. That's right. We can't, can't change everything, but we can make subtle changes and we can certainly improve ourselves by doing that, by those approaches. And yes, whatever we learn and is, is shared, um, that is a very Luciferian premise um, because you have to pass Gnosis on. Um, again, the Sufis have a wonderful um, perspective in that they believe that if you try and hang on to any knowledge or wisdom, you lose it. It's only by sharing it that it actually blossoms and is sustainable. If we keep it, we lose it. If, well, the, the figure of Woden is, is very different to Odin. Um, and the, one of my future books, I'm going to dedicate to the differences between them. Um, of course, they are often conflated in our time. 
And I think they were also conflated. Um, the perceptions of the early prototypes of Odin were conflated with the prototypes of Odin in the Roman era. And I think what they were witnessing um, of the elder gods, um, the ones that they related closest to um, the one they perceived as, as Mercury, um, was the mediator of spirit and of cunning. I think that sort of spirit definitely, um, it, you can see that alignment there where they, the Romans made that judgment. But again, the judgment of the Roman people um, that were Caesar and Tacitus, I think it was, that was looking at those spirits, they, they could only see elements various elements, and they were latching on to only the elements that they could recognize in association with their own Mercury and Hermes. So I think they were missing out on an awful lot of other things that were in the background that they were not noticing because they were not relevant to them. So I think that the, the actual spirits that they took as Mercury were far greater and had far more depth to them and much more well-rounded, um, but they were, not, they were not looking at them. So they took the closest things that they saw and related to them, which is, which is all about how we interpret. That's how the interpretano works, that you see something, you latch onto it, you automatically assume it's the same. But each one in its own right has got a great many other distinctions that don't correlate. And this, again, is, is a great danger of thinking that all gods are the same. Some have similar traits but they are individual in their own right. They have other traits that make them very different, very distinct. And, and also, in addition to being very different and distinct, they perform differently. They have a cultural element to them that cannot be understood by a different culture. And there are only certain amounts of things that you can overlap and interweave. The rest absolutely remain outside that and pertinent only to those cultures. They, you have to have the specific mindset, which is why many, many of these ancestral traits have become lost when we have just um, made everything um, so homogenous. We've homogenized the gods into almost extinction because we've said that everything is the same and it, it, they're not. They're really not. Um, only certain things at certain times have been the same. So when they, they produce this mercurial... Um, deity and say okay we can make Wednesday we'll, we'll name it after this um, planetary aspect is only some of the things that would be relevant but the accumulation again and the, the, um, the lateral um, qualities and virtues of all the other deities that make up that prominence would feed into it so yes we have something that's very similar but only superficially and of course, we've got other things besides Mercury. We've got saints that were called Mercurius. We've got heroes that were called Mercurius. And all of these things have um, their own virtue of spirit and their own um, force of being. And so that when they, again, become layered up, it's, it's hard to determine which bits we wish to relate to and how far back they go. Um, but it's, it is the same for many, many other deities. It's just that I'm focusing on these and how these were accumulated and trying to find the research. Because I think the problem with the Scandinavian deities in particular is that they've been so hijacked and so hackneyed. They've not been left alone like proper pantheons because, because they were proper pantheons. They had their own lists of, of virtues and correspondences, whereas the Scandinavian deities, because they've been presumed to have been a pantheon, they've been just, well, they've, they've, they've been plundered and they've been shaped and reshaped and added to because they've, they've literally been in a state of free fall because they were never actually written out as having these specific qualities because they belong to an oral tradition. There was never as, as distinct well, for Odin, we've got this, this, and this. And for Tyr, we've got this, this, and this. Only the people at that time would have known those things. They were never prevalent to anyone else. Um, so it, it's very difficult to actually separate what we've added on and what we've presumed from what was in actuality.
It is. And I think, I don't think we can decide or choose between memory and thought or myth and um, truth because truth changes with knowledge. Um, and so it's, they are both absolutely vital and must be taken in tandem. I don't think that we can distinguish. I know that there is a purpose in the story writer there. Um, Snorri saying, you know, he believed that memory was more important to him because for him as an orator, he, he had to rely on memory, it was his skill. Um, so for him, he, he believed that was most prominent. Um, so he chose that um, himself. But whether Odin would have done that is another matter. I think he evidently found them both because both of them were important. However, if we do not remember the past, then any knowledge we have is almost irrelevant. And if we can't have knowledge, then any memory has nowhere to go, which is why I believe they're both of equal importance for me personally. I would advise anyone to actually not abandon Odin or Woden because that wasn't my intention. My intention was to merely show how there had been so much ascribed to those figures that, that didn't, that shouldn't have ever been there, and that they are so much more um, than the sum of their parts, and that there is there's a whole history going back to the Neolithic period where the spirits of place, the land whites, the, the, the spirits of the ancestors, all the things that are in the other world have all been so appreciated and through the prominence of Odin in our time have been lost. So I, I would like people to go back to those more animistic practices um, with still having Odin in mind as a focus now, but to appreciate the animism that underlies the construction from the, that led to his development. So here's the end product of so much more that I would like to open people up to, to appreciating and going back to practicing and looking into and making part of their life because it's so much wider and deeper than, than the Odin God form that we've been led to believe. It's, it's actually quite hollow and shallow by comparison to everything that led up to that. So he's he's full of so much more. So I'm hoping that people will be able to see him as a bigger figure uh, with so much more to offer rather than less. But I want to see them see him in that truth of, of that genuine spirit that he acquired rather than just the facsimile that was created out of a, const a literary construct. Oh, thank you for that. That's wonderful. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. I was just so ill that someone was on the same wave. <laughs> wow. That is interesting. Thank you for that. That's that's made my day. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back, it began with my interest, or rather my absorption by runes. Um, because my mentor, Evan John Jones, was really um, a tremendous runester. Um, he was just fantastic. And he introduced me to runes. Um, and it was something I always struggled with. And then all of a sudden, it, um, through working with them and with him, I, it was like um, I suddenly understood them, just like Odin. And I thought, wow, you know, this is incredible. What, how do I suddenly have this great insight into them when, and I'm seeing things from them that are not written in books. How, how is this? Um, and what is this, where is this taking me? And so I became entranced by that, that spirit of the runes and, and, and how you see things in the other world. And, and so I then began to do research. And the more I researched, the more I just became overwhelmed by the, the warrior and the, 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 the mischief maker. And it just literally led me into, into what I needed to research. It took me into what I needed to see. Um, it guided me, that wisdom, um, into everything that I've written. Um, so I, that's, that's it, basically. Um, that's it.
Exactly. I, I think that's very well put. Yes, I, I agree. Um, and I think that is why it's so relevant today and must not lose that relevance because that spirit is, is the accumulation. It's in the now. And of course, the Scandinavian people are all about the moment of now. Everything exists in this moment um, because this moment is, is what the future is made from. It's the cusp of the past into the future. Um, so that's that's everything that Odin embodies, taking that past forward. So it's forever rolling on in wisdom and knowledge and action, because he is that perfect combination of action and thought, um, because there is no one way out the other. So, yeah, I think that's very well said. Um, yes, in the rest of the North, North and Other World series, um, I, I, I got to explore, uh, I mean, much of this has already been written, and it was actually separated from that tome because it was getting so huge. So I've had to separate it out, portion, portion it out into other books, subjects. So there's um, the, the trade and migration and the the Rus, um, all about the Silk Road and and how the, the um, Scandinavians, the, the Swedish people went over into the Rus and developed um, quite interesting um, figures there. And um, there's one about the continuity of cult, which is exactly what you were talking about there, about how that is relevant today and how we've continued those cultic beliefs and how they are relevant today. Um, there's there's one about um, Sather and the Volas. And there's, oh, now then, there's one about Woden that um, I go heavily into the Nine Herbs Charm and his his work in magics and the Merseburg Charm and, and others. So I actually look at Spellcraft and the Wild Hunt. So that's that one. Um, I think there's another one, but I can't remember it at the moment off the top of my head. I know they are listed in the back of the book, um, but there are a few more to come in this series. Um, um, the, the Place of Woman, and how women were in Norse society from the ordinary woman in the house doing spinning to the, the goddesses themselves, to the norns, to the desire, to the filia, to everything that was feminine in their world, the deity, ancestor, otherworldly spirit or mother. Thank you for inviting me, listening. Thank you very much. See you soon. Bye-bye.